Uh, the, the moderator will be Michael Aaron, uh, who is the uh, senior political correspondent for the New Jersey uh, Network, host and producer of the Reporters Roundtable with Michael Aaron, a, week a weekly program for New Jersey reporters, and the host and co-producer of On the Record, New Jersey, NJN's uh, weekly public affairs program. On the panel, we have State Senator Nia Gill. Uh, she is uh, a, a current state senator, was elected in 2001, and served before that in the New Jersey General Assembly uh, from 1993 to, to 2001. She has a uh, JD from Rutgers University. Um, we also have uh, the Honorable Scott Rumana, who is the mayor of Wayne. He was elected uh, mayor in 2001. He was in the Wayne Town Council from 1994 to 1997 and a Passaic County Freeholder from 1996 to 2000. Uh, we also have uh, a member from my own department, I'm pleased to have, uh, Professor Michael Thompson. He's an assistant professor of political science. He's the founder and editor of Logos, an online magazine, a journal of modern society and culture. He's written at least two books, I believe, not more, and several articles on everything from political theory to urban policy. Uh, he has his Ph.D. from uh, City U University of New York. Um, we are also expecting Honorable Jose Torres, the mayor of Patterson, and hopefully he'll be here soon. He was elected mayor in 2002, the first Latino mayor. Is this working? Yes, good. Pardon me? Don't need it? You're probably right. You're Dr. Spirit's fan, right? Okay. Uh, for the two uh, elected officials who weren't here. Oh, it is necessary. Ah. Well, hey, come back a second. Come back a second. Is this? Yeah, podium mic's all right? All right. Okay. All right. All right. They, they come from behind the curtain when you uh, least expect them. Uh, for the two elected officials here, pardon me? No, yeah, but for the two who are here, it's all right. Um, let me just uh, summarize what I heard this morning so that we can pick up from there. Um, uh, we were talking largely about the suburbanization of America and of New Jersey. Um, and there was a general sense that suburbanization comes with uh, some unwelcome things as well, consumerism, uh, radical individualism, a loss of a sense of community that exists in cities, but less so in suburbs. Um, and when Mayor Tories gets here, we'll have a, an urban mayor, we have a suburban mayor, uh, we have a state senator who represents a district that, what, Nia, is primarily suburban? Primarily suburban. Is Clifton in your district? Is Clifton primarily suburban, would you say? Okay. Um, let me start by asking Michael Thompson uh, you were here this morning listening. Uh, I, I heard a notion this morning uh, from uh, either from Elizabeth Cohen, the professor from Harvard, or from somebody who was asking a question that uh, we may have reached a point in our history where suburbanization is ending. We've saturated the suburbs and we're about to experience a rebirth of urbanization. You want to comment on that or on any other thing you heard this morning? Well, I, mean, I disagree. I don't think that, uh, um, that suburbanization is at its end. Um, I think there's, um, there is this sense, you know, you see cities like New York, you know, Manhattan, you know, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles. This, in our kind of cultural imagination is what a lot of people think of when the term the idea of the city you know especially I uh, tell my urban seminar this semester teach a seminar on urban crisis 
and just thinking about the cultural nuances of the word urban, you know, they have both simultaneously negative and positive, you know, uh, connotations. And I think that what the real problem is, I mean, there's one whole discourse about the culture of suburbs and what that means for our political culture and the rest. That's, that's an important thing to discuss. But the real central problem, I think, especially why New Jersey is such an interesting place to look at because it is this patchwork quilt of urban, suburban, you know, uh, neighborhoods and communities, is the problem that I see is not so much with the suburbanization, but rather with the extent to which our urban communities are becoming more and more irrelevant. Inequalities between urban and suburban areas are widening. And I think uh, at all levels, not just just in terms of you know uh, class, but there's a there's a new relationship between our urban and suburban which is emerging, and I think the inequalities, the gaps, the spatial dimension of this, is actually becoming more and more permanent and enduring. And actually, those cities, you know, Pattersons, the Newarks, the Sayaks, um are the cities that we have to start talking about when we talk about inequality, we talk about race, even the gendered aspect, ethnic aspect of Can what's happening. I stop you there the, as a TV guy. I'm accustomed to cutting people off uh, to keep a flow going, and you, you raised an interesting point. And the department chair, whose first name I heard but can't remember, Wartina. I've never heard that name before, so your mother, <laughs> your mother made it up. Your mother and father made it up. Okay. Okay. Warren and Tina. Oh, all right. I figured something out here. Um, Michael just suggested uh, that cities are becoming irrelevant uh, in the political culture here in this state. What do you think about that? People know that, um, in effect, uh, this is where money, this is where they can gather, gather money, this is where they are uh, voters and so forth in a sort of specific sort of way. Um, cities become less relevant because the real issues, the important issues that are, in, especially issues related to economic inequality, are not issues that a lot of politicians in general are, are really, to, really ready to address. And you can look at specifically at our last national campaign. That, uh, that the national presidential campaign. I mean, people were not talking about issues of inequality in, in cities. People were not addressing these issues. They were really concerned about, you know, these talking about what's happening outside of these cities when there's very, very real problems happening in these urban areas. Uh, Nia Gill, would you agree that, uh, that the political discourse, either at the national level or at the state level that you participate in, uh, is ignoring the issues of the cities? No. I think the c cities are re very relevant. I represent um, the cross-section. I live in Montclair. I represent Montclair, Glen Ridge, East Orange, Clifton, and West Patterson. And you can't get much of a mix in that. And what you find is that there is, in fact, a commonality in issues that uh, tie the suburban areas to those areas that you would uh, think would be urban and therefore not have any kind of relationship. For example, the uh, urban areas are becoming in increasingly more important given the uh, smart growth and the fact that you cannot build and develop anymore in the highlands. So, and, and along with, and I agree with that, and along with the issue of open space, so that where do you go to build? You go back to these cities and the older suburban uh, neighborhoods, uh, Patterson, Newark, where they have an infrastructure. So they are facing the same kinds of demands, imminent domain. Eminent domain in um, an urban area is as important as it is in the suburban area. And of course we know, of course I, if 
I can put a plug in here. I do have a bill in um, that addresses the issue of eminent dom domain. One, to make it more transparent with public participation. And two, that the government cannot take your home, an, a non-blighted area, take it from you and give it to a developer. That the developer can, in fact, buy it for you, but at the market price that you two determine. So you will find that the issues of eminent domain in the urban areas are equally as important in the suburban areas as to what we will do in terms of, and you can cut me off anytime you want, what, <laughs> what we will do in terms of how our cities will look. And the second thing that we also are working on is the idea of the big box. What happens when a Walmart comes in and the state has already invested millions in downtown uh, redevelopment in both urban and suburban, and then they come in and take from that uh, client base and uh, the business and the jobs go to another area, and what happens to the downtowns in both Clifton, Montclair, Patterson, Nork, East Orange, and wherever. So there are those issues of, since you cannot develop in an area, that the suburban and urban areas really have more similar issues than dissimilar, but the how you discuss them, people want to make it different, but really, when you make a critical analysis, it's the same issue in the same place, and how do we arrive at a solution? No, no, I was about to stop you there, but you, you're a Paul. You knew when to stop. Uh, um, Mayor Torres, uh, we just started. We just started, and we've been talking about uh, cities and suburbs all day here. And uh, this panel got underway with the suggestion from the gentleman on your left that cities have lost power. Cities are uh, becoming almost irrelevant. Uh, I want to go to the mayor of Wayne, who's the mayor of a suburban town, and ask him to pick up on what Senator Gill just suggested, that cities and suburbs really share the same problems. What, what, what do you say to that? Well, I, I think that the senator <clears throat> is right on point on uh, with, with respect to the Highlands Act. I think the impact of that act is very significant and to, to overlook the significance in terms of the importance and the growth in, in the urban centers is is not being it's going to force development in the urban centers there's no there's no question about that and you have to really because i don't want to repeat exactly what the senator said just coupling the statistic in uh, regarding the growth of the population in the state of new jersey that is projected to occur over the next 10, 20 years or, and beyond. And I don't, unfortunately, have that, that, that statistic at my fingertips right now. I, I, know, it's, it, I know it's very significant. It's, it's millions of people projecting growth. You have to have housing for all the people that are going to be coming into the state. And since you can't build in the highlands, you can't build in the suburbs, certainly as, as easily as you once could, and, and I have to tell you, from, from our perspective here in Wayne, we have, we are, in our uh, humble opinion, we are overdeveloped as it is for what kind of community we want to be. So we don't want to have the residential housing growth here. And between the Highlands Act and then the attitudes of elected officials in this, even the suburban communities, are going to keep on pushing housing growth to occur in the urban centers. Well, that sounds like a good thing for you and Patterson, yes? No? Uh, absolutely. Uh, continue to broker those uh, Mount Laurel RCA agreements to build housing where our neighboring towns, the most affluent towns, have, have acquired the tools to, to circumvent them to build affordable housing in their town. Um, the issue is that if towns like Patterson doesn't take advantage, then where are the people going to go? Where is the affordable housing stock is going to uh, get generated? Um, and more and more, I think the frustration of
people road rage and, and wanted to have a little more quality time to take two to three hours of your schedule um, to be on the road, less time with your loved ones, less time that you're being productive. So I think that uh, uh, that's the reason why more people are moving back to, to the inner city. Uh, Patterson, historically, one of the oldest industrial cities in the nation, uh, the cradle of industry, um, but we're a hub. Um, very few cities could, could um, boast that we have over 80 different ethnic groups uh, uh, in our city. So yes, we have a share of parades and, and diversity, and that's a good thing. That's not a problem to have. Our traffic, and that's not a problem to have either. But uh, I think that as, as, as towns and suburbia uh, continue to niche to, to create this, this prototype uh, city, which many times individuals that moved out of Patterson moved out because they wanted the bigger and the better, uh, um, not so much that they just didn't like city living. Um, so Patterson in this past three years, three years uh, under my leadership has been uh, courting uh, those people, courting those immigrants. Um, our industrial base is not longer there, but uh, our courts, our service, our restaurants. Do you think we've hit a period in time in history where the cities are going to, generally speaking now, the cities of New Jersey, say, are going to uh, experience a rebirth? I, I believe so, Mike. I think that as, as towns such as Wayne and Hawthorne and Franklin Lakes uh, uh, become, you know, two-acre community and so regulated on their zoning, uh, um, I think it's going to come back to the inner city where, where it all started. Um, let me ask anybody to... to uh, we were talking about the, the suburbanization uh, of America earlier today, and... Uh, I, let me throw this out to anybody who wants to pick it up. Uh, looking back over the last 30, 40 years, uh, as this suburb of Wayne developed and became what it is today, which I guess is a highly developed uh, suburb, uh, did Patterson suffer? Did, uh, has Patterson suffered because of the development of Wayne next door? Yeah, I think so, um, you know, in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s when the growth of the housing stock was occurring here a lot of the a lot of the people who were moving into those homes were from Patterson my father's one of them my father grew up on Montclair Avenue in Patterson uh, that's where he was born and raised and then you know uh, when he was going to get married and have his own family he moved he moved out of the city some people don't like city living. I mean, I, that's really what it came down to for them. They, they wanted a yard. They wanted more space around them. Unfortunately, that space started evaporating as more and more housing was developing. I mean, Wayne, for anybody who doesn't know this, was, was a farming community. I mean, most of this town was a whole bunch of farms over, over uh, in, historically. And, and unfortunately, housing developments were taking up all of those old farm lots but the issue of how the cities will be reborn and housing stock needed I, I just want to mention one thing I, I don't envision just low-income moderate income housing being the the, the housing stock I, I I would think that you're going to have all sorts of of uh, economic um, all representation from all economic levels moving back into the cities like like the rebirth of Hoboken by way of example I mean it was a city that was was tired and was old and it has been reborn now that's a unique situation because of its proximity to New York City but in, but it's going to happen at least we also have to hope it's going to happen in cities like Patterson and Newark and, and beyond about the uh, East Orange in your legislative district is that a city that is experiencing any kind of rebirth Yes, it is, and I think there are uh, interesting questions. The RCAs, uh, where a wealthier town, um, in order to fulfill their affordable housing, will give that money and credit to an urban area. I do have issues with that, because that can produce a concentration of uh, poor people in one area. And 
contribution agreement between a suburban town and a, and a receiving city. Go ahead. And so what it does, it uh, can perpetuate a kind of segregated society that's segregated based upon income. And if all of the, if I, if we in town X uh, build $2 million homes, and we then give to city Y, our RCA, we don't, we in town X with the $2 million home, we won't have a mixture in our town. Uh, and I think the issue of affordable housing in the suburban and those other communities also has a social context. And if you look at statistics, New Jersey is 47th in the nation in segregated schools because why their housing pattern has been segregated. Well, let me ask Mayor Thor, do you still like these regional contribution agreements, um, even if they end up le putting the uh, low income in your city and leaving the suburbs uh, fairly segregated, and the city segregated? I kind of, uh, and why do I agree with, with uh, the senator? Um, but that's the way the, the deal was structured. The, the legislature allowed that towns could actually come into this agreement. What I've concentrated in Patterson was to, along the lines what uh, uh, the Mayor Wayne indicated, is to create a balance, a mixture of commercial, uh, market rate, and affordable. So when you take the RCA agreement, uh, the RCA contract or monies, and you use those dollars to leverage other dollars to provide housing opportunities for those who will no longer have that, th those, uh, those means uh, and create it, uh, allow it to util utilize it as an economic tool to leverage or bring value, monetary value, to a bigger development that's going to give me a commercial strip, that's going to give me market rate housing, and at the same time uh, uh, live up to our COA agreements of affordability, then, then, then I think that it's up to the user how he uses it. You're not going to create a concentration of of, of low housing because then basically what we're doing is exercising or uh, utilizing the leverage of those dollars to be to create uh, public housing developments and we know that uh, um, what what bring great problems public housing development utilizing dollars uh, the federal government dollars has brought to municipality as a burden let me ask Nia Gill to go back to East Orange for a second tell us uh, how you view it and its health at the moment uh, I, I think that uh, with the issue of the redevelopment and, and on the issue of the RCAs, it's not simply from uh, what the city does because they can be created. It, it's what the suburban communities lose. Uh, and I think that when you talk about a social uh, accountability uh, for a diverse community, uh, so it's more what the suburbs lose by not having affordable housing and having that kind of interaction with other people. Before we go to East Orange, I'm going to get... What has Wayne done with its affordable housing uh, um... fully complied with all of the requirements that we've had to comply with? Does that mean you've built the housing or you've we've built... entered into a regional contribution agreement with well, the city? Well, the formula is, um, in our case, the first round numbers required us to build 1,000 housing units. We sold off 500 of those units. We then went through the formula of so much rehabilitation housing, so much senior housing, and the balance of the low to moderate income housing. But that's not the issue. See, the issue, the problem you have with the formula is the 5 to 1 ratio. Every unit of affordable housing that a developer builds, you get four units of market rate housing. And that's where it stinks for us, because these guys, they, they're not, developers aren't here to be friendly to people who are poor. They're here to make a lot of money. So what they do is they build these huge complexes, and they put this much affordable housing in their, in their complex. That's what's wrong about the system. So You're your, killing towns. So of your thousand uh, units that you were required to build, how many did you actually provide in your town, and how Five, many have you farmed out to cities? Five hundred. Five hundred. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me ask uh, Professor Thompson um, 
you've been hearing these officials uh, suggest that that uh, that you're wrong, uh, that the cities are not that the cities are not irrelevant. Uh, you you, you want to defend your initial point? My basic point was obviously not that cities are irrelevant, but that no, you, you said it. <laughs> what I said. I don't know what, what I what I what I what I'm really getting at was, and I should have probably said this, which I didn't say, which is there is um, there's kind of a model in urban economics, a kind of classical model of urban of of how cities form, and it goes back to you know a German theorist in 1827 named Fontunen who said <clears throat> basically you have the center city, and then basically you have land rents which decrease as you move away from the center city. In the center of the city is where the market, uh, well, this, uh, you know, <clears throat> marketplace takes place. This is where a lot of economic activity, dense concentrations of population. As you leave that center city, rents decrease because of distance from. So you have this core and you have these peripheral circles called Fontunen rings. This is still the, still the basic model in neoclassical urban economic theory. And what I'm saying is that works fine when you talk about Manhattan, when you talk about Chicago. And broadly, broadly speaking, that makes sense. But if you decide to put your core as something like, say, Patterson, and then the outer rings of suburbs around it, I think there's an increasing economic irrelevance of that core urban region. One of the reasons is because there's a the word segregation has to be brought up here. It's absolutely true, I think. Ethnically, racially, class-wise, uh, this, this problem between the relation to urban and suburban basically boils down to a kind of class, race, racial, ethnic segregation in America. The other thing is um, what Elizabeth Cohen brings up in her book, which is this not, sh which is the, it, one of the things that shopping malls and uh, mollification does is transfer that old function of the city center, which is where you go to the city center to buy things. And you know, in Patterson, I was born in Patterson, and my mother used to talk about how, when she was younger, they'd go into uh, the city center and buy things and come back out and whatever. Now, you really don't need to go there, right? Newark, maybe sometimes people go there for the for the art complex. They have the the, the NJ Pack thing, or you go maybe to some of the restaurants in the Ironbound District. Other, other than that, there's really no one that, I go to Patterson, I go to the Arab neighborhood and buy things there and food and stuff. Uh, but uh, honestly, I think the suburban rings really see the cities as irrelevant. And I think that's increasing the, the sense of segregation. Let me stop you there. Scott Ramona, do you go into Patterson to shop or to buy Food. I, I buy Arab food in Patterson too, but go ahead. Do you? I don't go to shop too often for anything, so. <laughs> You're off to work. I, <laughs> I have to tell you the truth. I work in, as a lawyer and I work as a, as a mayor, and that's about all the time I have. But I mean, I. I um, you know, I, it's ironic that you're both saying the, the Arab section for the food, because actually that does bring me down there too <laughs> on occasion. But the. Uh, um, no, not really. But again, I really don't. I don't go to Willowbrook either all too often. So I have to tell you the truth. I'm not a good and, and gauge. And suggested in her opening remarks that the big box, the Walmart the thing, is threatening to both cities and suburban towns, or maybe I don't. Yeah, is that right? Did you, so is Walmart a, a force for evil in this world? I mean, Walmart is a force that we should recognize and uh, be able to uh, partner with in a more progressive way that uh, maintains a balance between what Walmart, what Walmart can get as opposed to what they want and uh, what should be happening in um, our suburban and urban centers in terms of commerce. I am uh, chair of the Commerce Committee uh, in the Senate so the issue, and we know in the wealth of the nation, they talk about, Adam talks about uh, small businesses being the backbone of American 
democracy and that that is not only the economic engine but that that model also drives the philosophical uh, precepts that underline American democracy. So uh, I think we have to uh, have a partnership and a balance. Uh, we should recognize that in our public policy issues because the way we make the uh, statutory requirements drives the public policy. The public policy doesn't drive the legislation. The legislation drives the public policy. And so when you do Highlands, I didn't know, some people may not have known that it would have effect on Church Street in Montclair. Where now, and I've had a law office there for 22 years, where now uh, the developers come in, and some of my best friends are developers, uh, developers come in and the stores on Church Street that had been there for 30 years, they no longer can afford to be there. And so they are displaced in this rush for redevelopment and it's based upon how we have decided as a society that I agree with. You shouldn't have it in the Highlands, we should maintain open space. And, um, and briefly, the issue of uh, the eminent domain also in the suburbs, because there's always that downtown part that everybody, that's a little seedy, and um, you know, if you, could, if you could have them secede from the town, it would be just fine. Of course, that doesn't happen in Wayne, and I understand that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, even in Montclair, and I'm, I'm being serious, so you still have within the suburban districts that issue of where what should the development be and who has a right to maintain their uh, personal and their uh, property after they've been there 30 years uh, and uh, have been able to keep the city together. So I think it is multifaceted. Um, We're in the midst of a gubernatorial campaign in New Jersey uh, in which the number one issue in the state is property taxes. Uh, and most of us who pay any attention to, to New Jersey government know that New Jersey uh, has more local governments uh, per square mile than any state in the nation by far. Uh, we have a mayor in from Wayne, we have a state senator who represents five different municipalities, five, and we have a, a city mayor. Um, does any of you think that New Jersey has too many local governments and you should sort of throw in the towel and hand the keys to the guy next door? I'm, I'm going to uh, jump on that. A little bit. I, I think that if the question is that there is a redundancy in government, I would say yes. Um, however, there there needs to be some streamlining in order to be able to get a handle on on appropriations and budget matters. Um, we continue to see duplications, duplications between X amount of superintendents of schools, duplication between X amount of uh, police chiefs, school boards. Um, so I think that we need to regionalize a little bit better so that we'd be able to to um, do those traditional things as centralized purchasing and contracting and instead of buying five different types of widgets, buy one so that we could uh, actually maintain value to, to that purchase. Um, Patterson has been kicked around and where the county seat is being... Uh, the county seat where, and I got to add that, you know, bringing back to the value of, 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 of inner city, a city like Patterson, um, sure, uh, you go to buy a tie in Willowbrook, but you come to your hospital in Patterson, you come to your courts in Patterson, you come to your jails in Patterson, you come to your federal building in Patterson, you come to your, all your major transportation hubs in Patterson, these are all exempt from, from the formula. Uh, um, so talking about assets, those are key assets that inner city brings uh, um, to the table. So I think that there's room to, to regionalize a little bit more, um, to understand the, the needs, um, 
and done in a, in a holistic approach, um, piggybacking a little bit what the senator said about eminent domain. I, I agree. We shouldn't be developing at the request of developers. But when you do something like Patterson did uh, 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 during my administration, first thing I did was ask the governing body to allow me to do a new master plan. And then the master plan gave evidence that we needed to come up with areas in need of, of redevelopment. Uh, that was very evident. Did you have to take some homes uh, yet there? And no, because part of my strategy in, in going out and going to the public and asking them what do they want, how do they want to see their neighborhood formed uh, and redeveloped based on that the principle that no one knows the community better than the one who lives here, uh, uh, whether it's the Dublin section, the Middle Eastern section, uh, the Latino section, uh, you, you make them players. They, they're stakeholders. Is that why we need all these local governments? Because nobody knows better than the people who live there what the place needs? That's the reason why I say we need to be a little bit more regionalized so that we could get a better perspective on the needs of, of, of the people and then establish government to, to, to uh, provide the services to those needs. Scott Romano, what's your take on uh, whether we have too many local governments? I, I just think that why I said you know, that's, a, that's a tough issue <clears throat> is the, the, the attitudes of the people that live in the various communities, they want to keep their local government. That's, and that's the tough battles, the culture that's been, that we've all been brought up with. You, you just know you've got your local mayor, your local council, your local police department, and I, you know, you, you see the frustration with property taxes, and there's no question that you could actually cut down the cost and cut down the property tax bill by consolidation. I don't, I don't think anybody can really have an argument with that. I just, I just see that the battle line that will be drawn, and I, I don't think it's a party battle line. I think that, you know, the, the legislature that would probably have to take that step, it would be mayhem for a while to try and navigate through people that. People want their local governments. But Michael Thompson, what do you what do you think about that, people? Well, yeah, people want their local governments. It's fine. I think the, I mean, it's an old-fashioned, like, social democrat or something, but I, I think there's just not enough uh, federal government in terms of, in terms of, I mean, one of the reasons for uh, the rising of uh, local, um, you know, property taxes is because you start to have these municipalities, these, these, these cities and towns, having to take care of a lot more of them, of their own economic, you know, needs, and uh, that the federal government has slowly, over the past 20 years, crept out of, of, uh, of, of you know, helping. Um, I mean, for example, in Newark, um, during the war on poverty, what. Uh, Mayor Torres said this was, this was the basic model that was used. In other words, the federal government didn't go in and say, okay, we're going to go in this big bureaucratic apparatus and give you just throw money at, this, at the problem. There were community boards, the community uh, groups formed, which said, okay, look, draw up lists of the things that you want or need in your community, you know, public goods and whatever they may be, or, or, you know, what, give us a list. And these, you had all these federal bureaucrats who would go out there and meet and say, okay, let's, okay, we can, we can probably fund this project and that project and this project and that project, right? And I think that the, the problem that happens is when you rely more and more on each of these, you know, more and more localization, right? The problem becomes that these inequalities between these different municipalities get grow sharper, and also as these tax you know, property taxes rise, you start erecting tax barriers so that there's less and less movement from people coming to be able to get out of the cities who want to maybe migrate out. And therefore, that's what I was saying before, that you have this, you start having this kind of cave-in effect where people can't get out. Nia Gil, do you share that view that uh, the inequalities are, are sort of hardening, uh, that there's less mobility between city and suburb? Uh, no, n because the district I represent, there's a, a great deal of mobility. Uh, people move in from Patterson in Passaic. Uh, Clifton is one of the most diverse cities um, in uh, New Jersey. And also, um, in the discussion of what makes it uh, similar, uh, 
my position has been, and they said, oh, well, you know, you'll never get elected in Clifton because, you know, it's demographics, uh, well, at least for the voters, would be Eastern Europeans. And so we are so into apartheid politics that we fail to realize that there's a commonality. And so if uh, I have a constituent in East Orange and her mother doesn't have health insurance, and I have a constituent in Clifton and her mother's Polish and she doesn't have health insurance, let's get real. Our mothers don't have health insurance. So you come around and issue, for example, property taxes. You would think that the discussion of property taxes would be in Montclair and um, Glenridge. But we have that discussion in East Orange because in terms of their income, the people in East Orange pay more in property taxes percentage of their income than Clifton and Montclair and Glen Ridge so that there is a common uh, commonality and we have a dialogue that's based upon that commonality and then we can go to issues of regionalizing for the purpose of purchasing a fire truck or for the purpose of purchasing paper but because we are so much into apartheid politics in New Jersey, I'm black, you're green, I live in the suburbs, I live in Fourth Ward Montclair, you live in Upper Montclair, you live in West Montclair. Uh, it seems that the only time we come together is when we are attacked. And then our enemies make us understand that we have everything in common. And then when that, set, when that threat recedes, we're back into our apartheid politics that I find to be intellectually dishonest. I find it to be socially repugnant. And so, I am an African-American woman. Uh, you may think I'm Afrocentric. My great-grandmother was Irish. And uh, if you come into my house, that's one of the people you will see uh, and she couldn't marry my great-grandfather, but she loved him nonetheless. So that we come from that kind of culture, but in New Jersey, uh, the way we practice politics and the way we have discussions about public issues, it drives us apart, and it does not bring us together. That point brings me uh, to uh, a point that was raised by my friend Dewar McLeod this morning in a discussion um, uh, he, he was bemoaning, I think, if I'm paraphrasing him correctly, the lack of a sense of community uh, in, in this state or uh, among modern people circa 2005. But I hear, for example, I hear Mayor Romana saying that if you uh, tried to do away with local government or merge local governments, people would rebel. Uh, that suggests that, in fact, there is a sense of community in a place like Wayne, New Jersey, where there's really no downtown, as far as I know. Maybe I haven't seen it, but uh, <laughs> so so. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so do we have the same kind of sense of community that uh, they had on the prairie, uh, and uh, or? Or is this something that's that's vanished? I think it's it it's different than what it was, you know, in, a, in years gone by. But everything changes over time. So I, you know, I think there is a strong sense of community for what is the modern sense of what that means. I mean, you get um, a huge number of people involved in the athletic programs, just by way of example, who volunteer their time to coach. And, and there's hundreds and hundreds or thousands of, of kids that participate in that. I mean, that's certainly a community-oriented thing. I mean, and, and people, that they take great... Sports. That might not be well, a love of that, Wayne. That might be a so love the, of So that may be a bad one to pick, except that it was an easy one to pick. I mean, the people who serve in the fire departments and the first aid squads that are all volunteer. And, you know, I mean, everybody who who... Uh, through the churches and the synagogues and I mean all of that involvement is community oriented um, I, I don't I don't want to jump off the subject we, we're trying to go to but I do think the one thing that we left out of the mix with the, the discussion a moment ago 
is the funding for school systems, which is really the big problem with property taxes. And it's, we all love the schools. I've got one of our commissioners sitting right here, Jane Hutchinson, from, from our Wayne Board of Education. I mean, I don't want to walk out of here thinking that I'm anti-school. I'm clearly not anti-school. I'm very much supportive of the school system. But the funding of school systems statewide is, is, is the issue. And for looking around the room with students, and if you own your home, I don't take offense to this statement or, or if you already know about this, but when I first got my when I bought my first house and I looked at my property tax bill, I didn't know how it got divided up. 55% of the money goes to the school system. It's your biggest portion of what you send out in your property tax bill. So that's, that's, the, ma that's the major portion of what you, spent, what you pay for. And how are we going to address that, that issue? Because other states do it differently. I mean, New Jersey just relies too much on property taxes to fund the system. Now, if you're going to fund it, you know, I understand where the legislature and the governor comes from because you don't want to just say, oh, fine, we're going to raise your income taxes through the roof and give you everything back to reduce the property tax bill so they look like the bad guy when I understand they don't want to. But there's got to, that's where the problem has to be addressed. I mean, you need, and you need to know the money that you're going to need to function in the system. Every town, wants the type of education system that they have today. So we're, we're up against the real challenge because, you know, uh, Wayne needs, we're at 112, 110 million this year. You know, Patterson's at 400 million, 500 million. I mean, I just want to, I just want to pursue that community sense of community. Hey, thought. No, 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 that's all right. It was a good, it was a good path to lead us down. I just want to stay where we are for one second. Uh, uh, Mayor Torres, are, are people in Patterson proud of Patterson? Not only those in Patterson, but those who left Patterson are still proud of Patterson. Sure uh, 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 yeah, I, I have a sense. Um, over 2,000 congregate in Florida just to get together with old Pattersonians. And everywhere I go, uh, roots come back to Patterson. And I think that that uh, uh, coming back to that to that cradle, to that hub of immigrants and migrants where with grandfathers and aunts and aunts and mothers and dads, that that was a town that gave them opportunity. That was a town that they could still get their their, uh, uh, um, uh, their ethnic dishes, and that was a town that that gelled them together. And sure, as they uh, moved up the economic scale, they decided to move to Wayne, to to Franklin Lakes, to Hawthorne, to West Patterson. The majority of the people who lived around the surrounding neighborhood of Patterson all came from Patterson. And at one time or another, they still come back. Uh, over 30,000 vehicles arrive at Patterson daily uh, to support that city. Uh, so I think they're still proud. Now, granted, you know, the economy of scale changed, thing has changed. But I really think that utilizing our diversity as that fuel engine of bringing value back to the town, it's that common ground that you can still go out there and connect to your roots. And uh, those are the strengths that inner city brings. Uh, street smart. I'd rather have uh, uh, my daughter raised right on, uh, on the street that we live on for 15 years because, sure, she get a perspective of, of what life is like about when I get home or mom or grandma. But it is that street smarts that she gets within the city of Patterson that's really going to uh, uh, kick her up a notch, to, to, to coin a phrase from, uh, from, from Emerald. So um, those, that's, that's great things that bring value. Now, uh, I want to go back to the, the issue of the tax. Uh, uh, when, and, and regionization and home rule. When municipalities have to send out the tax bill that gets divvied up in four parts, as, as Scott indicated, and have no, no bearings, the day you want to bring accountability to taxation, let everybody send their own tax bill out. Now you'll see that there will be a more accountability, that the Board of Education won't cost X amount of million, that county government won't cost X amount of million, that every time legislatures want to do a referendum that's going to offer a tax. Uh, uh, my portion of my tax bill basically has maintained uh, I've been holding my own. But I have to find the extra money of all those other ones that I'm not, I don't have the power of the purse strings to control. Um, anybody want to add anything on this uh, community, sense of community question, or shall we stay with, with the school funding situation? What is that? Have we 
uh, do what's the definition? Because I think people can form communities around issues, even though they don't live in the same town. Uh, that they can work together, uh, and that they can come together, uh, is a sense of community. Um, simply uh, identification with an identification with a geographical location, uh, or are there other uh, kinds of uh, community? Let me stop you there. Do you think that people do identify with their town in your district? Are, are people proud of their town? Are they? Well, you is know, there a community spirit in your town? In your towns? I went to Montclair High School and. Uh, my family's been there for a hundred years, so it's a little difficult for, for me to say <laughs> not that I don't have Mountie born and a Mountie uh, bred. And when I die, I'll be a Mountie dead. But <laughs> I, I, I don't have a lot of identification with my town. But I think that people move in and people are more transient. And so you may not have that identification in Montclair. It may be a place that you've moved to from New York for other reasons, but you do have a sense of community around an issue. And so um, are we using a scale of community that is not always, or a definition of community that's not necessarily uh, totally encompassing of what has been happening in the last 10 or 20 years? Um, Thurston figures that he we, he lives in Montclair. We live in Montclair, but his part of his sense of community is Dole Country because he came from Great Bend, Kansas. So, but he has an identification with Montclair. But because of the internet, he has a sense of community of where he was born. So it's how we discuss that and bring people together on the basic um, idea. Professor Thompson, any thought on the sense of community and whether it's uh, non-existent or thriving or somewhere in between? I, I, I mean, I think there's obviously senses of community. Um, I think, though, with especially when you talk about local politics, and the, I used to be a, a reporter for a local newspaper in North Jersey. What town? Um, it was Wanakew and uh, Ringwood and all that there. So I had to go every month to these, to, to the, uh, you know, town meetings and and one of the things that kind of really strikes you is that I think the sense of, I mean, you talk about real, the idea of having like a sense of a political community, I don't think really exists. I mean, a sense of community, like, okay, I identify with where, I, where I'm from, whatever, maybe block parties or something, maybe. But I think there's a sense that uh, citizenship now, in terms of that classical idea of political citizenship, I mean, is basically about, it's, it's circuits basically defined by self-interest that, especially that's taxpayer the citizenship that we made this morning here was that uh, we, we've we that it's weak this sense of community yeah, and and that we're all out for ourselves now I think basically that's I mean I don't know how, how deep it is but I think <laughs> I just, not me but, but I think uh, I think that um, and you know, this came up in in uh, uh, Professor Cohen's talk where um, with the black family that was moving into uh, uh, what was it, Teaneck? I don't Levittown. Levittown. I'm sorry, uh, but I know something similar did happen. You know, in Teaneck, right? And in other words, it was you know in that line. You know, probably a nice guy, but you know, my value of my house is getting on two thousand dollars. I think that kind of sense that is the the kind of this kind of taxpayer citizenship. This idea, like my what's the reason? I'll, the only reason I'm going to read the local papers to see what's not just what the kids did in the sports team, but also like if there's anything on the bill, it's going to make my taxes go up. They're going to reassess the house. This becomes politics rather than that classical, I get romantic about it, but the Aristotelian idea of the good citizen, which was that, you know, you do things for the public good. You do things to put the community over self-interest. That was the classical ideal in Aristotle's politics, which inspired basically 1,800 years of, of political thought. All right, let me stop you there. Um, Two more points before we wrap up in about five minutes. So, one, does anybody have a concrete suggestion for what the state should do to relieve the burden on property taxes as the funding source for education? There's a lot of states that have 
done a lot of different things to to uh, to alleviate property tax problem or never had the property tax problem because they have a different system. So we can look to all those other states as uh, as models for us to follow. And in this case, we're not worrying about being the leader at this point. Right now, we've got a major problem. It is the problem. It is the, you know, I'll tell you right now, I am running for re-election right now. I know it's a big issue in the campaign for me, uh, you know, with, between myself and my opponent. Um, and, uh, you know, I keep on stressing the fact that it is not a Wayne Township problem, it is a state of New Jersey problem, and it really is. I mean, every, during budget season, February, March, April, May, pick up the paper, read it every day, and every single article from every single town always talks about the property tax increase. And they're all saying the exact same, I mean, literally, a reporter has the easiest job in the world during that time of year. Because we all say the same thing, contractual salary increases, Health care costs going up, um, you know, you have the side issues like garbage collection, insurance and, uh, costs, pension, well I said health, health insurance, oh. and, right, or all insurance, and that's it. Because most towns nowadays, I have to tell you the truth, we have stripped out everything that would be uh, discretionary spending. So we have to hike some other tax statewide, right? <clears throat> well, shift the burden that's what uh, I mean. Well, the property cool. taxes, and whether you go to sales tax, whether you use the, you know, the casino monies, which were always supposed to be used to balance out school, uh, issue, you know, school funding issues. But the frustration is very clear. The public has had it up to here with property taxes. The, but the, but then goes back to your other issue. You know, is the public mad enough to say, well, okay, we'll consolidate the towns, and that's where it gets really interesting. It almost comes back to your community issue too, because there is that sense of community. Yes, there's apathy. Yes, there's, yes, there's, um, you know, people are people are self-centered in, in a lot of respects. Every time you have an issue, the big crowd comes out when it's the issue in their backyard. But at the end of the day, there's still this sense of, of pride in, in in where they live, and uh, you know the the, the interest that. Uh, just one final note on that. I mean, we have a thing called Wayne Day every year. We get 30,000 people at this event. I mean, I, I think that's a good indication that people enjoy... You're giving away money? Or? No, no. Uh, <laughs> just come and wanna, visit. Go ahead, Mayor. I, I just want to add to, to the piggyback what the professor said before earlier. I think that if we look at uh, um, famous Abbott decision, the courts, that, that clearly it was the in, uh, the imbalance of expenditures of one region to another which put us in this mess. So obviously it's about the funding source. And then if we look at the role that, that local government pay, uh, state government pay, county government, state government, and then federal government, that if we want to be competitive, that if we truly believe that, that uh, education is that ticket to power, that education is what's going to advance us in technology and agriculture. If we really truly believe that, then let's, let's put our money where our mouth is, and the federal government's going to have to take a role. If we could build third world countries, if we could spend endless, unlimited amount of resources, and yet when we're coming back to basically take care of home, uh, we're not doing that, but yet from an early age we say, oh, your ticket to, to power is education, and yet the federal government is not doing enough. I'm going to take the bold approach. I really think that the answer, if it's the money, and those poor districts was getting less, and those wealthier districts was getting maybe even more, that the only way to balance it out is truly through an income tax. Fund that, education. On that note, I think uh, it's time to wrap up. I just want... Thanks. <laughs> I took the boat. You mean you don't have the an you don't have the answer either? Oh, I don't have it down. Okay. Uh, let me let me let me just leave you where let me leave you where I meant to begin. I always like to begin a speaking uh, engagement with a joke, and I, I forgot that this today. Um, so I'm, I'm searching my mind for a local government joke, and I have one. It's not really on the topic we're discussing here, but it's relevant to local government. It has to do with Hudson County government. Now, Hudson County, for those who may not know, is legendary as uh, uh, the county in New Jersey where the rules are stretched the farthest, uh, to put it kindly. 
and uh, sort of a home of machine politics traditionally. And the machine once back years ago uh, decided that they needed to uh, find a job for this political hack who had helped them get elected and they had to do something with him. So uh, they made him, they decided to make him, you, you know this one? <laughs> they decided to make him uh, head of the Office of Weights and Measures. So they put out a press release and they said tomorrow we'll have a press conference to formally name him head of the Office of Weights and Measures. So the next day, the press conference, a couple reporters assembled around. They introduced the guy. Everybody applauds. He's now head of the Office of Weights and Measures. Any questions? And first guy, reporter, wise guy reporter, raises his hand and says to the guy who just got the appointment, yeah, Joe, how many ounces in a pound? And the guy says, come on, guys, this is my first day. <laughs> uh, thank you all for... Uh, <laughs> being with us today. You just hold it just a second. Um, I'd like for, um, we have a couple of quick minutes. I'd like to open the floor up uh, to see if there were some questions from the floor. Just very short, because we don't have a lot of time for questions, but just one or two questions perhaps for, from the, pa uh, for the panelists, uh, the woman in the light blue sweater. Faith. I have a question as to, did any of the council mayor or the mayor believe that a county student exchange program would be probable or beneficial to your students to, and Patterson have a very good GPA, a very involved so and so like that, to kind of have them have the experience of a suburban education. So to to ex expose them to the different different teaching styles. Because I know I lived in Mars Township before I moved to North Elizabeth. So when I lived in Mars Township, I'm right on the borderline where I had the choice to go to Mars Township High, which was Mars View, Mars, Mars Hills or something like that. Or I could go to Mars Town High School. I chose Mars Town High School because of the of the diversity of ethnicities. So I was wondering if you believe that this a, a county exchange program bringing the students who are academic, academically advanced, I don't want to say smarter, but academically advanced within your county and allowing them to come into Wayne so that they have that experience? Um, I, I'm a tr I'm a firm believer in exchange students and giving an opportunity of letting people go and find their own little niches. Uh, we've done it. Um, I just recently formulated an exchange with, with even a sister city in, in Salerno, Italy. Uh, uh, so th those are good things and uh, they're very positive and, and you know, um, we continue to do it. And based on, you, you said the key word, that you chose to go where there was, you were, there was a there was that diversity. I pride, I pride that the city of Patterson um, is one of the most diverse cities. And you find your niche. It's a wonderful feeling to, to go into different countries every other block in your town. And so there's, that brings value that you will never get in the textbooks. You have to go out there, you have to experience it. Uh, um, so I welcome that. And uh, it was the same thing with, with, with TAC, uh, or VOTAC. 70% uh, um, of the students 80% of the students are all Patterson students, but yet it is a vocational technical high school. The bulk of it gets paid by Patterson. So, you know, sure, regionalization, exchange, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. I encourage you. Uh, my question for me, of course, uh, I was happy you brought up the AVID program. Uh, I'm from a, a suburban area, and there's a lot of AVID programs in the city. I know my town was affected by the cap uh, that the legislature put on the raising of property taxes where we no longer have the money to fund our own school system the way we would like to, but we're paying into the AVID program, which I view in many others view as a failure, whereas the AVID schools aren't doing the job of educating the cities that they're in. And I was just wondering how you felt, because I was reading an article in the Star Ledger the other day where the SEC hung off funding on a lot of Patterson schools and a lot of other schools in order to go ahead with a handful of 
experimental projects, which will cost 12 times more than just a regular school. I mean, putting a dome over a stadium, a rooftop stadium, or apartments in a high school. And it seems to me, being from a small, you know, well-to-do town, that we're paying in and with property taxes, and it's just being wasted by through the Apple decision and through the SEC. Um, I think Senator Gilder answered more exactly to the intent of the legislation. <laughs> but I will tell you this part. The SEC, it's a whole, uh, uh, um, the cap, from my understanding, was done to put a hold on the administrative components. When you continue to look at districts, Patterson in particular, and maybe in your town, the legislature said, you can't keep on moving the administrative end endlessly, openly, by just introducing these budgets because administratively you want that. That's, that's what we call wasteful spending. Now, is it in the books? Is it in the education? No, you'll see that a great portion of the school budgets is to administratively. So the intent of the cap was to get a handle on it, that you just cannot continue to introduce this runaway budget and think that it's because of education. If it's for education, it's one thing. But if it's for the, uh, um, the fat in it, then, then, or the slippage, as, as, as Scott was mentioning earlier, then not so. Now, when we talk about the construction on the SEC, it was truly an intent that, for example, in Patterson, we don't have the luxury to shut down a half a billion dollar corporation that has no community design and no community use that would not only utilize that expenditure as an economic development tool, but at least, at minimum, since mommy and grandpa and dad are still working at, at 6.30, 7.30, to be able to use those new school designs that have a, school com a community design component so that the community could have leverage to support instead of shutting down that corporation at 2.30, 3.30 in the afternoon. That, we thought, uh, was the intent between looking at alternatives, whether it's we having putting health care in our schools, whether we're having gymnasium, uh, uh, additional soccer facilities in order to support uh, a more geriatric or, or physical education component that in inner cities we don't have. Uh, uh, my fields, I can't keep up with my fields because we go from soccer to track to, to baseball to football. They don't get a rest. And I have to hydro seed it and never give a chance to grow. Those other more affluent towns, they got that astral turf. They got that stuff that you could run on it for five years and it always looked green. <laughs> Those monies that can build 12 Patterson schools, to go to building one experimental school, what Patterson needs to school? The, the experimental component on the Renaissance, under the SEC and the Renaissance zone, I think there were seven areas. For example, Patterson was earmarked for one. And the one that was earmarked was Hinchcliffe Stadium. Okay, now, under the pro forma of the school, their five-year facility plan, they, they opted to, rent a, to take Hinkler Stadium, the, art, the, the, the oldest outdoor arena and the largest prior to Continental being built, many very historical components, to create that into a sports business academy so that we leverage the dollars where all the towns want to buy, build new arenas and, and, and new stadiums to take one that had fallen to urban decay revitalize it and use it as a school facility. It's that combination. So those seven renaissance zones was not only to just say, oh, we're just going to spend $32 million on Hinchcliffe Stadium. It's what role could we invest public dollars to leverage the economic development of the entire regional area of the Great Fall Festival that then uh, six months passed and then it became a state park. And if you looked at today's paper, thousands of people came to visit uh, the Great Falls uh, uh, the largest east of the Mississippi in order to see where Hamilton and George Washington sat there and said we're going to be the first planned industrial city because we cannot depend on foreign trade any longer as we develop and roll out. So coal manufacturing plant, sales, locomotive, you name it, Patterson has been the first. So we have to make those investments where years ago we've been building out the other cities and, and we neglected our own inner cities. I voted against the caps. I was probably uh, one of two or three senators who did uh, because I thought that it was uh, unfair to suburban districts and that in suburban districts, uh, unless we change the funding formula, the school funding formula, you can add more money and you still will simply, in terms of percentage, 
uh, still um, receive the same. Uh, there are two things to change the school funding formula to more accurately reflect suburban districts. For example, in Montclair, because you go by property value as part of the equation, you can have two or three people, um, like Mr. Aaron used to live in a $200 million house, and then you have me. <laughs> but we're going to base uh, the equation on a couple of $200 million houses and then say, well, Montclair doesn't need uh, that much money because they're property rich. So we have to change the school funding formula to accurately reflect uh, the suburban needs, one. And uh, you find in most a uh, great deal of the educational issues, special ed that's mandated by the federal government, but the federal government only pays 40%. So that we need to do it on that basis. Uh, and for the SEC, um, we put in, um, and when I was in the assembly, we would not vote for the bill unless you also made money available to the suburban districts within the bond. Um, and that happened, and uh, the suburban districts uh, were able to receive money to do uh, the, the uh, kind of building they need needed while we still follow the mandate of uh, the Abbott mandate. And we're under constitutional imperative to do that. There's very little, uh, it, there's no room, wiggle room. Uh, the, uh, the SEC was a, a disgrace. Um, so we're all agreeing on that. There, that. That sentiment, though, is, is the point of frustration that we see a lot in, you know, there, there's a real issue between the urban and suburban areas because urban areas are funded what do you get Julie about 90 percent of your budget 95 percent of your budget is funded through the state and from state income taxes so every time you're making income you're paying your income taxes and you're funding the schools in the urban centers and then in the suburbs we're funding 90 percent 95 percent of our schools through property taxes so you know the, the person who owns the suburban home who's paying an income tax, they're paying towards the schools in the urban centers, they're paying towards their own schools through property taxes, so they're getting a double whammy. And it's exactly where you see that, you know, we see the frustration in, in the suburbs. And, we, you know, people like me and, you know, who are understanding of the, of the, of the broad issue, you can't say, well, you can't cut off the urban center's education because the key to success, I mean, Joey hit it right on the head. It, the key to success in this country is to have a good education. <clears throat> it's the only way you're going to get ahead. It's the only way you're going to succeed in, 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 in terms of getting a good job and being able to afford uh, to get the income, to be able to afford a family and, 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 and progress through, through, uh, through life. But with that aside, I mean, it really comes down to changing the funding structure. You can't have the suburban communities constantly funding themselves through property taxes for their education. It, it's just got to change. And, and, I think, and I think that the senator really you know, recognizes that herself because of having the, the, the areas that in, of uh, communities that, that she represents. Um, it's, it's a challenge, but it does have to be dealt with. And you hope that this is a gubernatorial election year. One of these two guys is going to win, and, one of, and the winner has better take better well take on the challenge because if they don't four years from now if we're sitting here saying discussing the same exact things we were discussing 8 12 16 years ago that means that they're not doing their job well and we do know that when uh governor witt cut the income tax so let's so well, we I'm can not put it no 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 you're saying it no but i'm, I'm saying so that we could have a historical <clears throat> perspective on why we're, why we are at this point so it can help us make better decisions in the future. When she cut the income tax that we all, or a great deal of people, voted for and wanted, the income tax is constitutionally mandated to uh, municipal relief, which means you have more money uh, to give from the state back to the municipalities for income tax relief. We. And I think when we went for cutting the income tax, we went for the very uh, 
ideas that they were talking about, self-interest. It will give me $500 back. We didn't look at what the $500 that we all may have gotten back, if it came together as a community, what it was doing. So we decided, uh, in part, because of our self-interest, that we were going to have our income tax. So that removed billions of dollars from that stream. Now, if I was running for re-election at this point, but I won't be running for two years, how many of you, understanding that you're intelligent, you're progressive, and we understand the erosion of our tax base, and for these mayors who are doing an absolutely wonderful job and running, and running. so that's why I can <laughs> say this and they can't, how many of you would support an effort? I make a disclaimer, I am not advancing this effort. How many of you would support the effort to increase the income tax and to bring it at least back to the uh, position that it was before uh, it was uh, cut? Not many. Not many. And how many of you? Income tax, mm -hmm. sales taxes. I remember when casinos <coughs> were being allowed in Atlantic City, but that money was supposed to go to fund education. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, it, it goes. It went to the though it's supposed to, it may not be used. <laughs> it went to the PA, it went to the seniors. The lottery money. Not enough. Specifically, I would love to take another question, including the one from my dean, which I really want to take, but I cannot because of time. No, 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 no. What I was saying, is, my point was to say I really wanted to take to take one more question, but I really don't have the time. So I want to thank all of the panelists, uh, Mayor Romano, uh, Senator Gill, Mayor Torres, and Professor Thompson. I found it uh, particularly interesting that um, from the perspectives of the difference between the way academics approach politics and the way practitioners approach politics, there were sort of interesting divides there. Uh, but these discussions illustrate the importance of how we define these concepts, and Senator Gill actually um, alluded to that. When we talk about inequality, what do we mean? What do I mean by inequality? What did Professor Thompson mean by inequality? What did the, the, uh, the mayor, the mayor Torres, Mayor Romano, and Senator Gill mean by inequality? Uh, what do we mean by community? These are very important concepts, and we need to, uh, so to, to take those things into account. But regardless of how one approaches these issues, uh, it's important that it's, it was. Well, it illustrates how important these issues are, um, and it helps add to our broader understanding. So I hope that you enjoyed the discussions. Um, I know that I did. And on behalf of William Patterson University, I thank you for your participation.